that if he thinks that the British people are ready to go to war with either North Korea or Iran, he's deluded. We're not. BCFM. Now, tonight, it's the premiere of a a film which is called In My Mind. It's uh, actually a look back at um, a series from 50 years ago. In fact, it's exactly 50 years ago tonight that it first aired on the television. It's called The Prisoner, and there's a film which has just literally had its premiere up in Port Merion, where the series was filmed. This evening, and the film was made by Chris Rodley. We'll be hearing from him in a moment. But uh, right now, let's have a little t- listen to an extract from the film where Patrick McGowan, who's the, uh, the number six, he plays number six in The Prisoner, uh, he talks about how he got started in uh, television doing drama, TV drama, live TV drama, if you can imagine that. I imagine doing a live television drama for like an hour and a half. Anything that goes wrong, everyone's going to see you in the 1950s and 1960s where he cut his teeth as a TV actor. I had been doing a number of TV plays, a whole string of them, in the days when they were live. In other words, when it said in the studio vision on, you were exposed to the millions or however many that were watching and if you made a mistake you didn't have the privilege of going back and picking it up and correcting it so it was very exciting, good for the adrenaline. One of the plays that I did was uh, a play called The Big Knife by Clifford Odets in which I played an ageing movie star. Lou Grade saw it and at the time they were looking for someone to be in a new series that they were preparing called uh, Danger Man. Every government has its Secret Service branch. America, CIA, France, Desiem Bureau, England, MI5. A messy job? Well, that's when they usually call on me or someone like me. Oh, yes. My name is Drake. John Drake. He felt that it was a very stereotypic, Bond-like character that was a womanizer, carried a gun, and shot people. He didn't want to play someone that was um, full of himself. I can tell you that. He was good-looking, but it wasn't just his looks. You knew that he was always thinking, and you could always see in a scene, he was always working things out. He also moved very, very well. In fact, Lou Gray described it, that he moved like a panther. was firm and decisive. Other people have described it as he was defiant in every way. He can make even the act of putting on his dressing gown appear as a gesture of defiance. So there's a clip there from the film In My Mind by Chris Rodley, and I hope I'm joined on the line now by Chris from Port Marion. Hi, Chris, and welcome to The Politics Show. Hi, Tony. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you fine. Uh, can you tell us um, what first got you interested in this series? Because I know uh, watching the film the other night, absolutely fascinating to see that you actually were part of the kind of original, um, one, of the, one of the first programmes uh, in the first few years of uh, Channel 4. So w- what, what got first, first gave you the inspiration to go and make the original interviews with uh, Patrick McGoon about the series? Um, I think because I'm very, very old, and I saw it when it went out originally in 1967 and 68, and I was, you know, was, um, studying my for A levels, and uh, I'd never seen anything quite like it, and I'd never ever forgot it. I mean, I think there were things about it which, it's a cliche, but they're like indelible, and they make indelible marks on your mind. And uh, so many years later, when Channel Four started, and um, pretty much everyone and his little brother could get a, a gig there. Um, because there were, there were very heady days. I wrote a treatment for a film about the prisoner, and uh, even though I'd never made any television in my life, um, two days after I sent them the treatment, they called me up, said, come in. I went in. They said, we're going to make it. Um, but you don't know anything about it, do you, about television? I said, no. And they said, well, don't worry. We'll put you with a producer and a director, and all will be well. And, and um, within 10 days, I was in America for the very first time 
interviewing someone who had been my hero since I was a teenager. I mean, it was that kind of easy. But it wasn't. It didn't go too well, did it? It was Actually, I thought your film was, uh, honestly saying this, a wonderful piece of filmmaking because you managed to convey the fact that, obviously, as as interviewing Patrick McGowan, you're going to have to kind of sit him down, tell him what to do, and he wasn't having it, was he? He, Almost like the prisoner, number six, uh, the character in, in his series. Yeah, no, he wasn't having any of it. I think I think we all severely underestimated him. Um, we should have guessed. I mean, he is number six. He is those characters. Um, that's not a cat. I mean, it, it's it's him. So uh, I think the problem was it was my first ever film, and I was a fan, and I was easily intimidated. And when you're sitting with your hero and he's screaming at you, telling you, you know, this is how it's going to be. Um, it, it's uh, it's difficult. It was a, it was a very 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 difficult experience. Although you know I I I never didn't stop loving him in a way. But he made he didn't make life easy. Uh, he wasn't that wasn't his job. And quite right. I mean he saw me coming. I think uh, he is a very inexperienced person who has who's well he's well meaning. He loves my work, but he doesn't know what he's doing. So we better help him make a, a film properly, which he tried to do. But um, you know. It, it was tough. It was tough. Well, one of the things that most fascinated me was the way that you filmed this interview with him, where he kind of finished in in an empty house, and he switches the lights off and said, "Be seeing you." At the end of it, and you you go off thinking that you finished the film, and he's secretly managed to follow you to another destination. And then, so what? What? Tell us about that. That sounds. It was absolutely amazing. It was almost like must have been like being in the middle of some kind of spy movie. Yeah. Absolutely true. We we finished filming. We and I said, well, let's you know that was tough, but let's go treat ourselves to a, a few days in the Mojave Desert. And um, we drove off to the desert. Um, I still don't know how he found us, but we were in our hotel and the phone rang and it was him and he was already just down the road. I mean he, he, that sort of way of wrong footing you. Um, he said, I'm here. Come come talk to me now. Um, and he tried to buy all the footage back from us. I, I honestly, honestly don't know how he found us. Um, it, it doesn't sound possible. Uh, unless he followed us, literally. I don't know how he did that. I didn't even ask him. I didn't have the, the courage even or the nerve to ask, how did you find us? But he found us somehow. I don't know how. It is. It... Okay, can you tell us what's been going on up at Port Marion today then? Yeah, there's been, um, because um, The Prisoner was first shown literally 25, uh, 50 years ago today, to this date. Um, so there's been screenings of, well, there's my film, there's screening of, screenings of other episodes of The Prisoner, and people, the very, very few people who are still alive who were in um, in the show, uh, some of them are here. So they've been screening some episodes, there have been Q&As, um, and they're, they're still going on, they're going to be showing the first episode to the minute, actually, I think, to the minute that it was shown, literally. And they even put it showing contemporary ads to keep it absolutely in time. I mean, it's a kind of, it's a series that, that um, I guess, produces that kind of uh, fanaticism and that kind of dedication. Um, I mean, it doesn't happen for The Saint, uh, obviously, um, and many other series. It, it's it's sort of uh, fetishised. It's, it's well, very I strange. I mean, I think that's, that's a bit unfair, I think, because I certainly remember when I first watched it, I thought, well, this is fascinating. I don't understand it, but maybe one day I will. Yeah. Um, it's no, got a lot of yeah, layers, maybe. a lot of depth to the, the to the program, and I think the other thing is is the ending was very controversial at the time. I wonder if you could just explain why it was, because the series uh, sort of uh, the, the idea was that he was going to try and break out of this village, but then he yeah. never managed to. So w- w- tell us a bit about the controversy and why so many people were phoning up uh, the ITV at the time, the network centre, to complain. Well, I think because it set up some basic questions one was why did you resign and he wasn't telling you and and who is number one and no one was saying who number one was you only ever saw number two the sidekicks um and so i think people thought by for the last episode they would find out why he had resigned um what his real name was and who the hell number one was and they didn't find out any of those things well they found out that number one was him um, that him, the baddie and the goodie were the same person. So the controversy was because there was no meat. It was 
uh, sorry, we were losing you there, Chris. If you could just maybe you could just say say that again. I mean, what was what was going on there? Um, it was uh, it was because I mean, it's just trying to read into it. It was because what McGowan was trying to say with the series is that the biggest problems with uh, paranoia and with control and with fear are actually within ourselves, within our own minds, which I think is actually quite a profound statement. Absolutely. It's just a huge statement from Lou Grade and ITC and from a, a kind of company that gave you the saint and Danger Man and Man in a Suitcase and the Baron and the Persuaders. I mean, it was an ambitious, uh, ambitious kind of a thinking man's program, which was dressed up as a kind of spy series. So I think people were confused. Are, is it a spy series or is it some almost like a theater piece, like a very ambitious intellectual piece of work, which it was. And so I think they got confused. because. Because it was two things at the same time. Um, So he wanted to deliver an important message, which is our biggest enemy is ourselves. Um, But he did it in a kind of in the clothing of a of a, a kind of of the spy genre and i think you know you don't expect that of james bond you don't expect to go to a james bond movie and be thrust into all kinds of existential angst about what's wrong with the world and are you your own worst enemy you know you expect guy girls and guns and sex and lots of fast cars mm-hmm. well, let's, let's just have another clip from it now i'd be very very angry and disappointed if they hadn't watched if they hadn't jammed the switchboards at atv i would have been outraged i would have slunk around for years with my tail between my legs instead of which it was just terrific loved it and if i can do that again i'll do it again god love them watch it millions of them and be outraged as long as people feel something that's the great thing it's when they're walking around not thinking and not feeling that's 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 tough that's where all the dangerous stuff is because when you get a mob like that you can turn them into the sort of gang that hitler had we don't want that. We want people who say, hey, now, wait a minute. You don't do that to me. I felt that it was sort of designed for 1984. And um, it's ironic in some ways that it's, it's running in England again, the tail end of 83 and, I believe, into, into 84. 2000 and something, I don't know, maybe one or two people might want to see it then. <laughs> One of the things uh, that uh, McGoon also says in there that he was very pleased at the way it um, the, the, the series actually made people think. People uh, sort of wander around like zombies and they're not really thinking enough. And this series was designed to make them think. Anyway, it certainly is one of the I think one of the best TV dramas ever produced in Britain. But uh, uh, why is it that we're not making? We haven't kind of moved on. Uh, it, it seems, Chris, we haven't actually made anything better since. No, uh, it, it's it's unfortunate. We don't have any Lou Grade. It's as simple as that. I mean, I think people thought, I don't know what people thought or think about Lou Grade because he did, you know, Sunday Night, the London Palladium. But he also gave Sir Kenneth Clark his first break in television. Unfortunately, we don't have entrepreneurs like Lou Grade. That's one very, one very good reason why we don't do any, we're not doing better. We have a lot of very, very mediocre people running television, commissioning stuff. No one with the flair and the, and the, uh, you know the risk taking that Lou Lou Grade had. I mean, I mean is there anywhere? McGill- do you think there's anywhere now for writers who really do want to um, do some challenging dramas? Anywhere for them to go nowadays? I think you can do challenging drama. We have lots of challenging drama. We just don't have anything with quite the edge. You know, we have lots of very very thinky, you know, complicated television in the way that we we didn't have. I mean, television now. A lot of American actors will tell you they just want to be in TV. They don't want to be in movies because movies are so impoverished and thin um so we have lots of thinky good television we just don't have anything quite as um and, and, and edgy as the prisoner i think or as fantastical i mean what we're missing is real imagination we've got a lot of very very good and very realistic dreary drama which is fine <laughs> i love it also i mean I, amazing that the, the series what it does is it sort of sucks you in kind of lures you into a full sense of understanding what's going on and then kind of faces you at the end with all these kind of home truths um but anyway look in my mind great little film Chris, I must compliment you on it, having been privileged enough to watch it the other day. Uh, and I just wonder, whereabouts can people get hold of this? And are, is there going to be a sort of new release of the series or something on DVD or elsewhere? Yeah, there's um, uh, on the third whole reissue. The Wonders of Skype, eh? 
I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll put a link up on our show page at this week dot org dot uk to wherever you can get hold of in my mind i would imagine i think it's been organized by network who sell this stuff on dvd and i imagine it would be being released as a part of a package to do with a new dvd release of the series but anyway even though i'm not sure if you can still hear me chris uh the uh, line having gone down to port merion um uh, thanks very much for joining us on the politics show martin this program what it does is it's it starts there's all sorts of um, phrases in it that suggest that the secret services aren't all what they seem and it was quite fascinating to see that within britain there was enough kind of momentum within tv drama to say let's let's actually do a series which is really critical of the secret services and let's look do a series which is looking ahead at the potential for the abuse the fascistic abuse of surveillance? Well, um, what can I say? The, uh, the, I, I, I do remember the series when I, when I saw it, uh, when I was, <laughs> I was a child. Um, we used to watch it. I can't claim that I understood it. Uh, uh, and I think it was originally based upon um, a, 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 you know, a real, real place that used to be used in World War Two, where people who had been, you know, fallen out with the secret services were taken to be, you know, debriefed and. Uh, well, with George Mark Stein, he was, uh, I think, the script editor of the program, um, and he introduced some of the themes through the sh- through the series. Uh, George Mark Stein wrote a book called The Cooler which was based on fact, where uh, there are various types of agents that had been trained to go and work in, uh, be dropped into occupied Europe. But then they realised that these people are either too crazy or they know something they shouldn't know, so they had to go and send them for effectively indefinite training up in Scotland, in Valair Lodge, I think it was called, Mm -hmm. uh, a place uh, up near... um, up in the Highlands, I imagine, somewhere. But anyway, so, yes, it's based on something real. But also, I mean, the thing is, it's it's bringing people into this Secret Service world and finding out that actually it isn't necessarily as exciting, sexy as it seems. Well, I think there's there are fantastical elements in the film. That's what I remember as watching it as a child. I mean, I remember the, the white balloon that you would capture people by bounding around and, and landing on top of them. I don't think that was terribly realistic, Tony. So, in other words, you've got to, you know, there's still an element of this. This isn't a documentary about the Secret Services. It's one, a, of the, it's one, of the progra- one of the programmes, for example, um, one of the series, uh, is they're trying to find out why he wants to resign. Um, and what they do is they lay him down on a couch and um, they are somehow surveying his dreams and they're going into his dreams and so in his dreams they're coming up to him and asking him why he resigned and and then he realises in the dream he realises, oh my goodness, they've even got into my dreams they're trying to uh, get information from me that way but there is a, a sinister side to this now and that is this US policy of total information awareness well, I mean, we know that in actual fact the, uh, the, the, the tricks of the trade of spying, we've talked about strategic communications earlier, hybrid warfare, psychological warfare, uh, it's far more sophisticated now and far more intense than it was then. And it was pretty intense then. Um, and, of course, fictional dramas like this can help to, you know, conscientise people to what's going on. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a stickler for factual stuff. I prefer documentaries, and I prefer factual material. Yeah, but not many, not many people watch those. The Prisoner well, was watched by indeed. tens of millions of people. Well, that's right, and that's, that's the goal of drama. And more and more ever since. Well, indeed, and, and dra- drama has got its own justification. Isn't it fair anyway? to say that in drama you can say things that you could never say in, uh, say, for example, a factual article? That's, you- quite, that's quite right. So uh, Sybil Edmonds, for example, has written novels about uh, Gladio II, uh, because she used to be an FBI translator and so on. She's not trying to write factual books about what's happened. She's trying to write fictional books because they're going to be read more. So that's a tactic. Well, it might be stretching a point, but I think one of the reasons for all of this is that organised crime are everywhere. We were talking about the big four, uh, Deloitte's, uh, KPMG and the rest of them. Uh, this is n- if We've moved beyond, beyond a failure in regulation towards an organised assurance that people can get away with crime and no regulators or police are going to come and get them. Well, that's another, t- that's, another, that's another huge topic. We've got a criminalised elite which is using psychological warfare to try and dominate the planet. And some documentaries and some drama programmes are attempting to, uh, you know, to talk about these topics. I think, actually, I mean, I was thinking, try, trying to think to myself, who would write a good 
sort of prisoner today who would be a good writer to write something similar and you know who popped into my mind david southwell so let's have a listen to him now talking about how he thinks we should be tackling organized crime at the center at the top actually of our society my name is david southwell i'm the author of several books um, including history of organized crime and secrets and lies i actually really believe that the basis of dismantling organized crime making an impact on organized crime it's never about more police numbers it's never about increased budgets it is never about increased powers if you talk to as i have done anybody who is highly placed in a transnational criminal organization there are two things which really really worry them one of which is tackling prohibition because prohibition is one of the biggest sources of any criminal activity in criminal market and it's the other really big issue for them is actually making business much more difficult for them to do, which is all about tackling poverty, tackling poverty at a local level, um, tackling poverty at a global level. If, if you talk, Why does that make business more difficult for them? Because, you know, you're, quite often the very nature of organised crime is exploitative. It's very difficult to exploit those who are in secure financial situations. Um, Criminal activity, whether it's illegal immigration operations, illegal prostitution operations, if there isn't a base of poverty, it's very difficult to exploit people. So if you tackle poverty and you tackle prohibition, you're actually undermining criminal enterprises in a way that increased police powers, um, increased police resources can never hope to do. And... Um, one of the guys I interviewed for the history of organised crime was an Albania mafia organiser in the UK, a guy called Zef Nano, who was very closely involved in illegal immigration, drug running operations and illegal prostitution in the UK. And he was very clear and very explicit that he would not be able to thrive in terms of he, what he would see as entrepreneurship if there wasn't a base poverty which he was able to exploit for prostitution and immigration, and if there wasn't prohibition for the drugs. And so for him, the two biggest worries were taking those away, not increasing police powers, you know, not increasing police resources, police numbers. Those have very limited operational problems, which they, a, any big transnational criminal organisation can always get around by bribery, other routes, you know, redeploying resources. Actually tackling organised crime is much more fundamental and it really requires real political bravery, real bravery by us as people to say, you know, we are going to refuse to engage in allowing that level of poverty to exist, that level of prohibition to exist, because those are what permit and allow organised criminal activity to thrive. You want to tackle organised crime, tackle poverty, tackle prohibition. David Southwell there. And Martin, final topic, spin-off from The Prisoner, uh, is that there are big uh, organisations out there, including some, there's something called Le Cercle, uh, where big intelligence agencies actually do cooperate together, and so they're really completely out of any kind of democratic control. If you look at it uh, in, in nationally, most intelligence agencies have no control democratically, they just get taxpayers' money, but then they're actually organised in groups like Le Cercle, which is a fascistic group, uh, internationally. Yeah, well, there's a big overlap between organised crime and uh, intelligence services. So if you think of somebody like uh, Colonel Oliver North in the Iran-Contra affair, he's a big hero on uh, US network TV. But in actual fact, what he was involved with doing was with Adolfo Calero, the head of the, effort, uh, the, the, uh, the Contras, he was basically bringing massive amounts of drugs into the US with the support of the CIA. That's all on the record. But nobody's ever been punished and nobody ever will be punished. Time to sign off now for the Murdoch News at 7, coming up live on Facebook, Arabian Nights with Mohammed Makawi. Thanks to our guests in the first hour, Lib Dem Councillor for Brislington West, Joss Clark, and Labour Councillor for Avonmouth and Lawrence Weston, Donald Alexander. Thanks also to old Labour Oxford economist Martin Summers there, uh, and to, what was his name What's his name? Oh, uh, Chris Rodley, uh, who's done the film In My Mind about The Prisoner. Also, this show's story links and comment page is one word this week, dot org dot uk. You'll find me on Twitter at Tony Gosling. Here's wishing you a relaxing and enjoyable BCFM weekend. I'll leave you with music from 1991, The With It Boys and Shirley Lewis. Do please join us for the politics show at the same time next week. God bless and don't let the banksters get you down.
This is Bristol's BCFM on 93.2, online and on your mobile. BCFM is an award-winning community radio station for Bristol, bringing you national news on the hour, live from the Sky News Centre. 